So, hi, uh, my name is Johnny Hammond. I head up the Unilever Foundry, uh, which is Unilever's global platform for engaging with the startup ecosystem. Uh, so we look for new ways to communicate with, to understand uh, our consumers so that we can better serve them, uh, or for new disruptive business models for us to basically test, pilot, do proof of concept, and then scale across our organization. Judy. Hi, my name is Julie Fidel. I work for Bupa. Um, I work in a department called Customer Labs. Uh, it's a new, newly created team where we run accelerator programs and challenges to engage with the startup community and equally try and build the innovation capability within across Bupa. Um, we, have a, we operate in 190 co uh, countries, so it's a good challenge for us internally to do that. Uh, I'm Vinay. Um, I run the thing called the Commercial Growth Fund for Channel 4. Channel 4 is a public service broadcaster which is owned by the government and it makes its money from selling brand marketing advertising which is really expensive and can't be accessed by early stage companies. We make it available um, by trading that brand marketing services in return for equity in growth phase startups, uh, well anything post A. Um, and yeah, so and we're really like gathering investment returns and gathering data on the power of brand marketing uh, on earlier stage companies. Oh. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm with Ogilvy Consulting and we're the growth focused brand business and innovation consultancy inside a very large uh, multinational consulting group. And we work across brands, sectors and geographies with companies who are looking uh, to find new ways to grow through innovation. So how do you guys, you know, there's outside, we can, uh, there's crazy amounts of startups, young entrepreneurs, there's many corporate executives. How do you guys find that within your organizations you're able to help bridge and marry that opportunity that you find probably, Johnny, when you walk around, every startup wants to come to you and go, we want to work with Unilever, and obviously you like many of them, but how do you shape to find the ones that you want to work with and then help marry that through? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think you know, it's really important that we start with what is the business strategy, what's the business objective, uh, that we take that and look for startups that are going to be able to help solve some of those challenges or take advantage of some of those sorts of opportunities. So how is it relevant to our business and, and how can it help us to, to, to grow and scale and continue to serve consumers in the way that, that we want to? Um, in terms of uh, navigating the startup ecosystem, which is, is, which is quite challenging in itself, I think you know, we rely on events like this to meet great, uh, great uh, startups. We, we utilize uh, some third party support as well. And we make sure that we're always out there speaking to and engaging with the, kind of the ecosystem to understand uh, how a business may or may not be uh, beneficial for Unilever. So on one side, it's kind of that open door for startups to, to pitch and, and, uh, and see how they might be relevant for Unilever. And on the other side, it's an internal framework or platform uh, for brands, uh, for functions to basically deliver challenges to go out and proactively scout against. And Bupa Insurance, uh, we were talking before, I'm a customer of yours. Uh, how are you from the, in the insurance side? Obviously, it's a complicated business and obviously, you know, forever, you know, we now see insurer tech and I'm sure there'll be many other streams developing. How are you managing to keep ahead of a phenomenally ever-changing environment, but at the same time, your business that's, uh, you said, 110 years old? Uh, oh, so keep, yeah, keep we're, we're nearly 75 years <laughs> old. Um, I mean, that's a, a really tough question that we're, we're grappling with every day. I guess, um, What's really important for us is to be relentlessly focused on certain target areas. We have tried within the insurance space to be to really disrupt ourselves internally, um, and found that it's just not working for us because we don't have. There's a really big capability gap <clears throat> in in terms of what we have internally versus what's out in the marketplace. So I guess what we're trying to do is be really clear on what problems we're trying to solve for customers, um, and then also ensuring that our executives are really committed to delivering um, on those promises or those problems that we need to solve by partnering with startups. So a good example is um, we've, this is the second year we've run our accelerator program, so it's just we put challenges out to the marketplace and we work with startups. It's really exciting for the business for the first, I'd say, four or five weeks, and I'm not sure if you experience this too, but within the seventh or eighth week of the challenge of actually getting into the nitty gritty of what needs to happen, some of the excitement wears off for the business. So it's really being the partner to keep that momentum on getting that program completed. 
As I said, and Vinay, we spoke before, you mentioned about maintaining the culture through an organization. Obviously, Channel 4, as we know, is a government-owned but separately run. So how, how do you maintain that innovation culture within? Um, look, I think part of our remit is to be innovative. And so that's, that's kind of like within broadly the DNA. And it runs right the way through the top of the organization. If you're a creative organization which is targeting youth programming, then um, you have, you've got to be innovative. The creative function has to be innovative. Um, the, 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 the challenge is sometimes trying to look at all the noise and figure out what we need to do. The biggest rated youth show on any network on free-to-air television last year was Bake Off, right? So, and that's been, that's like telly from 20 years ago. So, so how do we triangulate the noise with actual delivering youth audiences? So, so like, as well as like, kind of like focusing on all the trends, we've got to understand what is the secret of the product we're delivering and, and can it resonate still with youth audiences. So, mm. so you don't throw the baby out of the bathwater necessarily. And Paul, obviously a lot of the work that you do is around working with brands and trying to help uh, them understand and stay relevant. I know we had Rory, one of your colleagues on uh, earlier, but from, from your side of when you're obviously going and talking to many organizations, how do you kind of help them understand they've got to push the boundaries a little bit? Like we, um, we, don't, we don't deal with a client that's not interested in innovation. And I don't think I've had a client that hasn't had a big kind of startup or innovation disaster, right? That's been very expensive, that's been about building something on a separate site and getting a lot of people um, to build a lot of things that once you try to bring them back into the organization, the kind of host doesn't accept the organ. Um, and I think we're in a second wave of that now with a lot of clients where they're kind of taking a step back and what we ask them to do is think about why they're innovating um, and what they're trying to achieve and what forces, what drivers are propelling them. Is it internal cultural change? Is it the market, right? Is it the changing consumer expectations, which we think is a really important one. And once you understand kind of what you're there for with innovation, then you can start saying, it will make sense to have a crowdsourcing platform. It will make sense to bring an innovation group inside. It will make sense to have a Silicon Valley outpost. Um, but I think there's been a, a kind of a rush to kind of, we got to innovate, kind of, we got to have a mobile app, we got to have a website, it goes all the way back. Um, the question around innovation is becoming a lot more kind of business critical and business focused now. I think we start there. Mm. Judy, I wanted to jump back to something you said before. You mentioned about managing expectations, obviously, when you did your accelerators and people lose interest. Do you find, though, with it, and actually, Johnny, I want you to jump in afterwards, about you have your corporates, you obviously say, right, we're going to have these accelerators, and obviously the startups then think that suddenly then they're going to have all investment, all partnerships, and your corporate, maybe executives saying, well, where's the ROI? How do you manage with that innovation isn't just that you're going to work with this company and then tomorrow they're going to solve your issue like that. How do you manage that for the startup and also for your internal stakeholders? Um, I, I guess it's just communication and telling you know, the executives and the, same, and the startups the same message again and again and again. So I guess when we um, engage with startups, we have a very clear guideline of what, how we uh, talk about, how we work with them, what the different phases are, and at which point then we'll have a discussion of if this is successful, if the pilot is successful, we would like to then take it into a further discussion of partnership, as an example. Um, and equally, when we're, we always communicate relentlessly with our um, startups throughout the process to ensure that they're comfortable with what's happening. So we're like the, the, the uh, bridge builders, our team. So we sit between the corporate and the startup, and it's huge stakeholder management. So the startups come to us and say, actually, the business was really excited, and now they're not, they're not excited anymore. So then we go to, the, to our executives and the business and say, okay, you know, the startups are feeling this way. So it's managing just having really clear communication on a daily basis. 
Yeah, I think I'd, I'd build on that as, as, you know, I agree with this communication sentiment. I think on the, on the startup side, it's about really being open and transparent with them about the process that they're going to go through, about the stage that they're at. And I think for us, how we, how we do that is making sure that we have great senior buy-in. So, so Paul Polman, our CEO, Keith Weed, our CM, CMO, both big fans of the Unilever Foundry. They help to drive and deliver that message. Uh, and I think at a team level, from the Unilever Foundry perspective, all of our team, except for me, have come from outside of the organization, so they've worked in startups, they've worked in tech, and they understand this world, and they understand what a startup might be going through. So when they're having these kind of questions from startups, often they've been through it themselves before, or they're able to kind of fully appreciate maybe the speed that a startup works at versus maybe a large corporate. And then from an internal side of things, I mean, large corporates like Unilever, we have you know, we have the choice of build, partner, invest, or acquire. And across Unilever, we do all four. So we have an acquisitions team that, you know, does the Dollar Shave Clubs, the Dermalogicas of this world. Uh, we have a venture arm that invests in startups. We have a build function, which is how do we build more soap and soup. And then we have a partner option, which is Foundry. And I think for us, it's really demonstrating to the business about how Unilever Foundry, from a partnership perspective, can lead to one of the other, one of the other three. So as an example, we can very quickly, via partnership, test to understand is a piece of technology, is a new business model, is a new startup viable, and then decide do we want to invest in them, do we want to acquire them, or do we want to continue in a partnership model? So we see it as being a route to one of the other three. So you're giving everyone the option, so you're giving yourselves the opportunity that you can steer it each way, so you've kind of got four pathways you can take. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Paul, you mentioned before you're building a, you've built a startup within a large, uh, WPP as we know is a large, uh, one of the world's largest communication agency, and you've built your business within Ogilvy. How have you found that? The, um, the consulting group is, 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 exists in order to provide a new level of service to, to our clients and, and to the market. And it has been decided by leadership that consulting um, is an important thing to do and to start bringing some of the analytical, the business rigor, um, and, and some of the business focus to, uh, to our offer. Um, in, a, in, a, in a fairly pointed and focused way, and that's grown now, and we now have um, a sizable behavioral science capability, thanks uh, very much to Rory. Um, this is where WPP understands um, where the market is going because it understands where um, its clients are going, right? Um, and so it just absolutely makes sense uh, to build this capability inside of, the, inside of the business and to give it the time that it needs in order to grow, as you would have to do with any kind of innovation initiative. And Vinay, uh, Channel 4, you've had, can you maybe share with us some examples of how you guys have partnered with some innovation and some of the ways you've tried to grow the business forward? Yeah, so like we see a problem in the market, a structural problem for early stage companies, which, uh, and it's, it's driven by, I think there's a kind of virtuous circle here. So, like, the, there's an industrial revolution taking place around consumer and broadly the, all the industries around digitization. That's leading to private investors coming in, raising money. Those investors need to show very lean unit economics, which favors near-term marketing, which, and we're a marketing services company, which, and, and brand marketing is really expensive. I think there's certain kinds of businesses which are deemed winners by getting to a certain milestone by proving really lean eco unit economics. That and that feeds into higher valuations, which are paper valuations, which feeds into f a funding cycle and that we go o over again. And that actually hurts fundamentally like um, companies like us. So we're trying to break that. So the, what we're trying to do is find those businesses where we know like, th there's a challenge coming down the road. It might be like in the neobank se sector where we see like no one's really invested in a brand, but we've got a huge valuation, it's a huge competitive intensity. Um, so could we invest there and get people onto the brand marketing? And we did, recently did a deal in the property space in, with like really the number two to Purple Bricks. Where it, you know, there is a question over unit economics, but it's also a brand play. So we invested as a minority investor uh, using our airtime to take a minority stake in uh, eMove. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the buzzwords of the day. I know the next panel, you know, blockchain, AI. Are you seeing now that kind of as the trends of new words come that the businesses are trying to, you know, suddenly now you've seen startups that have, everyone's now becoming an AI or blockchain startup, or are you still seeing that your focus is still looking much more at the end goal of IE, how you, you run a brand and how the brands connect with the consumers, or you're still looking at, all the stuff around that blockchain, AI, and... 
Yeah, I think it's important that we do both. Uh, so it's important that we take the business challenge and the business opportunity, and the answer to that may be blockchain, or it may be AI, or it may be something completely else. So rather than taking a brief saying, how do I use blockchain for Magnum? It's more about saying, <laughs> how do we engage with, uh, you know, how do we engage more consumers with our ice cream cabinets? You know, we have three and a half million ice cream cabinets around the world. Uh, what else could we be doing with that square foot space in the store, or, you know, to communicate with the consumers, to better understand them? Uh, maybe blockchain is a solution, but it's not. And then you also need to understand that, that, that technology as well to then proactively bring it back into the business as well, to be having those conversations with the senior leaders in the business to say, here is a space we need to engage in, and here is how it might be relevant. And it's similar to what you were saying before, is it's that kind of bridge or connector back into the organization. Mm -hmm. So it's translating startup or, or technology speak into Unilever speak and, and vice versa. Because I, I want to get, because Judy, we said before, obviously, Booper and brand is obviously the generation of customers before, you know, I, I became a Booper customer because my parents became mm -hmm. a customer in that way. And how are you seeing that you're engaging that generation Z? Because we're going to talk a little bit more now about the millennials, Gen yeah. Z, and how are you seeing yourselves? Because one is people realizing, one, that they need health insurance, and two, one, of realizing how to engage with yourselves. Yeah, so um, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's really hard at the moment what we're finding uh, one of our key problems to solve is engaging with the millennial um, population. They're, uh, from what we're finding, are a bit anti-establishment. They don't like the Booper brand itself. They, it represents everything old and um, clunky. So, um, and we're also represented as Booper across most of the 190 countries we, we're in. So it's, it, it's also internally a struggle to say, well, if we can't engage with this population, this millennial population, um, via the Booper brand, do we have to break off and do something completely new out of the normal constraints. Um, and we're investigating that right now. It is a real challenge, I'd say, for the executive team and um, our market units across the globe to actually have that conversation because we worked really hard to be this, you know, one brand that's, you know, you know our, our purpose is to help people live longer, healthier, happier lives. Do we want to deviate from that? Um, and from the, some of the feedback we're getting from millennials is they just don't feel the same connection for this big brand and they want something that's more flexible and not within the normal industry constraints. And oh, you alluded to it before with your content, but you seeing, because obviously Channel 4 has always been, you know, it's one of the, it's the channel that's trying to connect to some of the more fringes and that side. Are you seeing that now with the rise of Netflix, how are you guys keeping yourselves in that conversation? Uh, I mean, it's a structural challenge, clearly. Um, and, and it faces the entire broadcast industry. Um, we are youth focused. Uh, I think I, I read or I heard my, like, I read that Channel 4 is the youngest skewing broad, uh, broadcaster in the world. That's a function of our ownership structure and our specific focus. Mm. So, like, the, I think we will continue to reinvest in, well, we're, you know, I think we always want to be like the youngest. Uh, skewing, and that's a function. It is a function of our ownership structure. I think we have less kind of short-term commercial pressure, and we have a specific remit from our from the government to be the you know to be different. So I think we might have a little bit more commercial freedom, um, but yeah, ultimately, um, yeah, you know, Netflix is you know a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul, from the when you obviously were talking to brands, and that's. A, are you seeing yourselves trying to like strategize with them? If it's not just about now, it's the next few years ahead. How are you seeing that? Because ultimately, when you're working with designing campaigns, you're not just thinking about the today, it's yeah. the future and ahead of that. I mean, in innovation, in, when done correctly in a large organization, it operates on, on horizons, right? Mm. Because the fact is that a transformation, cultural platform, capabilities transformation to become an innovative company where that's been a deficit doesn't happen overnight. But it's also really def difficult to make the case for something that's going to take five years before it starts delivering any results. The way that we, we generally approach it is talking about, first of all, building resilience with what you have inside the organization now, right? What can you do today? What are the tweaks that you can make? Um, how can you start the narrative? And how can you start the kind of litany of small wins that are going to build your case, right, to a point where you go to the second point, which is about where you play to win? 
which is where you start taking the, the big kind of steps that will start to ensure that the competitive gap gets bigger, um, that you're making uh, serious inroads um, in actioning customer insights. And then um, there's not a company that shouldn't be thinking about what happens when in 10 years my product is so commoditized you know, that it's worthless, basically. Um, what's left of my company if I need to completely reinvent myself? And when we used to say, you know, 10 years ago, how would you reinvent your company if it were born digital? Five years ago, how would you reinvent your company if it were born mobile, right? Because this, how would you reinvent it if you were born in the cloud? And today we ask our clients kind of, how would you reinvent your company if it were born on 5G, right? Because 5G is gonna absolutely change everything all over again in ways that we're only beginning to understand. So the, the, it's the most difficult kind of interrogation because companies don't generally think on 10 year kind of frames in the West. Um, they think about next quarter, but the smart companies are absolutely looking at kind of the scenarios that they're likely to be facing and starting to put together preliminary plans. And Johnny, uh, thank you. You've obviously, the foundry is obviously one of those now like benchmarks of how corporates and startups uh, engage and interact together. And how are you seeing, obviously, you guys were one of the first to do it, one of the, how, We'll maybe share some tips to colleagues. Like, what's going to be the next generation of foundry, do you think, coming up? Because obviously, the, the model's constantly evolving. And where do you think, if we were sitting here in a couple of years' time, you'll see how corporates will be dealing with startups? Sure. I mean, for us, you know, we started in the space of, of marketing and ad tech. So how do we better c communicate with consumers? Unilever's got over 400 brands. We touch uh, 2 billion consumers every day. What's your favorite brand? brand? My favorite brand, Ben & Jerry's. I mean, <laughs> how, can you, how can you not choose Ben & Jerry's? Um, so I think, uh, you know, we've got a, a large company, and when we first launched Foundry, it was very much about getting the organization used to this notion of testing and learning and piloting and experimentation. And that needs to continue on, and marketing and ad tech is a growing and evolving territory and space. But what we've seen is, I guess from our perspective over the four years, is it evolved now into disruptive business models. So what is the Uber of hair care? What is the Airbnb of laundry? Uh, one of my favorite examples within there is a pilot that we've done uh, with uh, Signal, which is one of our toothpaste oral care brands, uh, and um, a startup called Playbrush. And what Playbrush does is a dongle that goes on the end of your child's toothbrush. Anyone who has kids in the audience trying to get your kids to brush their teeth is quite an arduous task. Uh, but basically, the, your child has to brush all the corners of their mouth to play the game on the smartphone because the device is connected to the smartphone and they can't pass the level. So for us, that's really interesting because it enables our brands to extend off the supermarket shelf to play more of a role in consumers' lives and actually make something quite engaging for them you know, and, and create a bonding moment between the parent and the child. So we've seen a move from the business into how do we extend our brands off the supermarket shelf, how do we move into kind of disruptive business models, so to speak. And I think in the future, what we're starting to see is how do we apply that to other parts of our business as well? Mm. How do we apply that to HR, to supply chain, to finance, to packaging? The similar sort of model that Foundry has, which is pilot, test and learn methodology, you know, I think can work across of our business. And it's really important that we start to look at not just product-based or marketing and ad tech, but lots of areas of our business that can, that can see large improvements. And, and do you think, like going back to the toothbrush game, are, are, do you think we'll be seeing more brands trying to, re, you know, because that's fantastic engagement for the, each generation. Do, do you think we'll be seeing more like when we get our Ben and Jerry's or Magnum will be like, having, uh, you know, much more into, I know you guys tried Beacons once with the Magna. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to see that brands are going to have to become more playful with everything to try and do? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I hope so. I, I feel like it's, a, it's more about finding what is the right role that you play in the consumer's lives. Like, how do you make the, their life easier, simpler, these sorts of things? You know, how do you make sure that you uh, embody some of the values that they have as well? So we ran another great pilot with a startup called Goodloop, which is an ethical media kind of distribution uh, for video. And I think in that, a consumer watching uh, a piece of Nord content is able to donate you know, money to a charity of their choice simply by watching our content. And I think for us, you're then able to make a stand for something that a consumer believes in. And that's going to bring those millennial consumers in because ethical sustainability is a big, big passion point for them. Mm. And Judy, from yours, and obviously, Johnny has 400 black brands he can play with. I don't know them all. No. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you going to manage to do stuff like that within, uh, within the Booper ecosystem? Um, well, I mean, it's a good question. I, I guess what we're trying to do is be 
really focus. So we don't just do insurance. So I guess our focus area for, for the next 12 months is our aged care um, businesses. So we're really trying to help people live longer um, in their homes so the elderly live longer and supported by technology. So that's one of our focus areas. So it's not just about disrupting insurance, but it's also well, how do we help our customers through all areas of their lives and their, their key touch points. And one of those is um, particularly the ageing population and not just for the person ageing, but also their family. So how are we supporting them? Um, and it's not just always about the gadgets and the cool little thing like that's, I really want one of those for my son now. Um, but it's about how do we provide, we're a service, or we're predominantly providing services, so it's not really tangible. How do we provide a really wonderful exper experience for our customers and the people that touch their lives? So I guess that's what we're really focusing on as well. And Vinay, from your side, with the, obviously the commercial growth, you know, what's like your main objective? Is it that you're wanting to get more users, more customers within, within the business engaging with your content, or it's more to make, keep yourselves more relevant. What's the objective that you're trying to achieve? It's a limited uh, focus, really. Um, um, yeah, we make money from selling a million, you know, advertising for millions to people like Lexus and Apple and Pinterest. Um, and actually we've, um, the startup community can't access that advertising. So what we're trying to do is firstly make a return by putting that advertising into earlier stage companies. So we're tracking, but also trying to address the structural issue we face, which is um, more traditional companies spend on brand marketing, newer companies don't. So, uh, and as well as making a financial return, I think we're trying to drive a bit of cultural change and awareness in the power of the, the main way we make money, which is selling brand marketing. Um, what could it evolve into? I, I, I don't know. I, I think like it could evolve into us aligning a bit deeper around our editorial themes and making more tangential investments, mm. potentially. And, and Paul, I, I'd like to use the phrase uh, sustainable innovation. Obviously, you guys within the whole Ad world's job is to make the brands excited to try and do that. How are we going to, how's the balance going to be of making the campaigns and the ways of working with the brands keep that sustainability rather than, like we're saying, you know, we jumped before, well, we'll just do something blockchain based because that's the fad of the moment and those things of keeping, keeping it real for them. I think of Rory's uh, slide he had up before of the doorman versus the, the automatic doors. Obviously, that's the challenge you guys have to keep exciting but keep relevant. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, at, at Ogilvy, our commitment is to make brands matter, right? Um, and this is really, if you think about it, it's pretty much the issue of the day. Categories are changing, customer expectations are changing, disruptors are chipping away at really well-known uh, and well-established companies. There's one falling out of the S&P 500 every two weeks, right? And the reason is because brands um, are not mattering the way that they need to. Um, and communications and advertising is a big part of that, and it's a big part of the life cycle. But what makes brands matter is the way that they resonate and the way that they get under the skin of their customers. And we can, everybody has a favorite um, unicorn that they like to refer to in this instance. Um, the question is not so much about kind of how do we create a campaign that's going to, that's going to excite people. Um, it's how do we build an ecosystem of communications, of experiences um, that are going to keep us relevant and to keep us mattering to our customers now uh, and, and, and forward looking. So we've heard a little bit about from all of you about how obviously your roles within the brands are trying to be that voice of innovation, keeping the businesses relevant to many of the startups in the audience who maybe want to come and talk to you, to partner you, how, how do you what advice do you have to them of how to work and engage with managing their expectations is coming through of how long it takes to work with, uh, so if I was a startup coming to you now and it was something you were looking for, how do you manage, how long was that process you reckon take to do a partnership and what kind of stuff should they be trying to ask you? 
Sure, yeah, I mean, that's specifically why we have the Unilever Foundry is so that we can partner. Uh, I mean, we were talking earlier about the kind of speedboat uh, oil tanker you know, um, analogy, and I think it's quite an interesting one, you know, and I think that's exactly why we have the Foundry is so that we can actually partner with the, with the startups. There's a space for them to come to, or, or a group or a team of people to, for them to come to to understand how their offering may or may not be relevant to Unilever. And we have you know, different procurement terms, different legal scope of work, all these sorts of things is designed to, I guess, fast track that process to enable us to, to deliver a proof of concept qu quickly or a minimum viable product. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big part of it. And then for them, I think it's really about understanding what is, the, what is the business challenge or what is the opportunity that you're helping Unilever to solve? How are you helping Unilever to connect with its consumers better, to, to understand its consumers better, these sorts of things. So having a really clear understanding of where you fit in that kind of, I guess, uh, user journey for a consumer and really understanding you know, what value you can bring and, and therefore what value Unilever can bring to you. And if people want to, and to get involved with your program, people do it through cohort base or you, every, people can just come up and email you or talk to you. How do you, because obviously it's like that whole bridge of you know what you're looking for and they want that. So what's the best way of people engaging with the Foundry? Sure, yeah, I mean, we, we have a website, uh, thefoundry.unilever.com uh, uh, um, and I think, you know, for us, that's probably the best place to start. There's a kind of an open call so out there. You're not going to give them your WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> So there's an open Zero call out seven. there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's an open call out there for, for startups, uh, basically to apply. Uh, we, every time someone uh, applies there, we then basically take that away and, and look at them, and then reach out uh, proactively to understand a bit more if there's an opportunity. But either way, we, we make sure we feed back to say yes, there is a fit. No, there isn't a fit. And sometimes it's timing as well. We meet a lot of fantastic startups that unfortunately it just isn't the right timing for them. So it's. It can be a message of, you guys are fantastic, we, we really want to see where you move and grow and develop, but it's not right now, let's re-engage in a few, few months' time. I think that's so important, and so many times we see that as well, is it's always the no isn't the problem, it's just people mm. getting the answer. You know, someone saying to you, hi, you're a great company, R wrong moment, wrong time, come back in six months. I think it, and it's really reassuring when you hear brands like yourselves, you give those answers rather than uh, people, as I say, going to this black hole vortex of never getting a, uh, an answer. Julie, you mentioned before, obviously, something that's quite interesting, because obviously, whilst insurance is your main reason, your obviously job is people getting ill is bad for your business because you then have to pay out, and obviously the whole <laughs> health side of things. <laughs> How are you, are you, are you seeing the, the diversification? Obviously, I've seen you know, other insurers, you know, they almost like pay people go to the gym, health apps, those things. Are you spreading your base so you can try and get involved? You mentioned getting involved in people's uh, lives. And how are you managing with the startups to reach out to communicate that you are as much interested in uh, maybe a fintech or an AI or a healthcare as much as someone with a new insurance uh, algorithm? Yeah, I guess to, to answer the first part of your question um, about rewards and different p parts of our businesses. So for ANZ, as an example, where um, obviously you probably can tell where, where I was based for, for eight years. Um, in Australia, it's illegal to give, to do any sort of gamification or points. Um, it's just, you can't do that within insurance. So we, we don't actually do that within that marketplace. But it's, it's something that is not really the executives within our organisation, any type of rewards, those types of reward systems, it just doesn't sit within our strategy. We, we, we want to help you get well um, and we want to find, find different ways to do that. Um, and that is, I, I guess for us it's more, well let's focus on areas and moments that matter. So we're really focused on families, young families and pregnancies. So what type of innovations could we do within that space? Um, what was your second part of the question? My second part was how keeping diversifying the companies that you're looking to work for. Yeah, so, um, and we're a really teeny, tiny um, group at the moment, so we're kind of that black vortex. Sometimes if you send an email to, uh, I'm going to be really honest, there's uh, eight of us in our team servicing the globe. Uh, we're looking to expand that, so we are really in the infant stages of working with startups. Anyone want a job at Booper? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're trying to you do. You get is free healthcare, by the way, if you. Uh, <laughs> free health. Well, yes, we do. <laughs> um, so what we're doing now is actually building out that platform. So if you go to the, um, you know, www.booper/customerlab, 
we have a, so a, a presence where you can learn about how we work and what we do. And at this point in time, we only put specific challenges out to the marketplace. So as for an example, earlier this year in March, we put a challenge out um, that was based around two problems to solve within our aged care space. So we're being very pointed at the moment around focus areas where we need to work with startups, um, particularly because we were getting uh, around, you know, a hundred different startups within one area around, um, you know, doctor, you know, on online doctor platform. So you can just you know, call a doctor. Like we got at least 150 different startups wanting to talk about that one specific idea. And we already have a strategy for that and we work with different organisations. So what we're trying to do now is, OK, let's A, see if we can work with startups because we need to build that capability internally. And the way we're doing that is being really focused on challenges throughout the year. So at the moment, we're running the aged care challenge, which, was, which is in flight. And Vinay, you're seeing, uh, we've spoken about Gen Z, we've spoken about millennials, we've spoken about the next thing. What do you think is, within the broadcasting world, the biggest challenge that they're facing? And what do you think is the solution to that? <laughs> and now I'm putting on the spot. Uh, um, structurally, um, viewing is um, in a steady decline. And, and youth is probably in a bigger decline. So that's probably the biggest issue. What's the answer? Um, I think you see more in the broadcaster consolidation and there'll be more economic power. I think there's more around cross industry. So historically, broadcasters fight, fight with each other. You might see consolidation and more international partnerships, particularly on ad tech and content production. So you can compete internationally with the digital giants. Those are probably two of the most logical ones. And that's already in play. And Paul, obviously, as we're coming, drawing to the end of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about differences of geographies, you know, from your side, seeing things from a global perspective, obviously here we're in the UK, how do you balance the innovation challenges you see maybe from America-based consumers, Asia, et cetera? Yeah, that works, on, that works on several tiers because there needs to be a first some kind of commitment to innovation to begin with. But when you're talking about a, a large company that's made up of a lot of different operating companies in a lot of different markets, and what you're going to find is that pretty much the closer you get to the person who's buying the product, the more important the innovation kind of initiative is, right? Because these are in-market folks facing, in many cases, existential questions about how they're going to retain that relevance, how they're going to keep mattering, um, and how they're going to keep kind of existing. Um, in, in X year's time. It's fantastic when you've got a strong central push to innovation, and some companies are doing that really well, that are supporting local regions and, and local markets, but certainly they understand that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to how you grow your business through innovation. Um, there are different, uh, different demographics, different social, social graphics, the, the um, digital maturity and the mobile maturity. Sometimes, actually, the innovation happens in the places where you might, you might expect it the least. Um, so it really is about first kind of giving permission, um, but then kind of at, at the local level, really kind of maybe asking forgiveness a bit more as you pursue uh, new ways to grow and innovate. Great. Uh, I think six or seven weeks ago, Johnny, we were in Singapore together. And how are you seeing from obviously your side of there's the Asia consumer, you know, obviously balancing the innovation challenges yeah. from Asia, Europe, and America? And how are you seeing obviously within your organization, you've got a global reach, but making things, you know, hyper local dealing with that side? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think um, uh, Singapore or Southeast Asia, which is where our Singapore head office is, is, covers that part of the world, is, is hugely important for us. I mean, there's 600 million consumers there, uh, half a million, half a billion, sorry, are under the age of 30. So there's a huge growing population. Smartphone adoption is through the roof. So you, you're uh, dealing with consumers in a very different way and a very different mentality than maybe some of the more uh, westernized countries over here. And I think, so it's really important that we have, I guess, these hubs mm. around the world. And Singapore is one of those great ones for us. Uh, there we also have Level 3, which is our co-working space, so 22,000 square feet with 150 desks, which really is about bringing Unilever even closer to the startup ecosystem. So, you know, we it's, uh, imagine coming and working inside a Unilever office but having your own space if you're a startup, the idea being that proximity breeds collaboration and we're more likely to lead to, to, to some pilots there. 
So it's really important to find what is the local nuance, what works for that market. Uh, and increasingly, we know that ideas can come from anywhere all around the world. So we need to be tapped into all of the different spaces around the world. And yourself, obviously, you said you've got Obviously, you are recently here from Australia. We've got our Anzac side of the, <laughs> of the group. How are you seeing the difference from, obviously, the work that you do? You said there's eight of you globally from, obviously, the challenges you face in Australia to here in London and the UK. Um, I guess it's to build on uh, Paul's point, actually, about um, allowing the, the local level to actually go on with innovation themselves. So I guess a few years ago, our strategy was to centralise innovation. I'm not like much much like large corporates, we all wanted to control it. So now what we're seeing is we're allowing the markets, we may have a challenge like within the aged care space globally, that's a target area, but we are letting the local um, market units execute and run with those challenges. So although we have a, a, a strategy and it's an overarching strategy, we let the, lo the local market units colour that, colour that in and really run with it at their level. Because if we're trying to control it centrally, um, it's just not moving fast enough and, and we're not finding it, we're getting any traction at all. Very good. Obviously, Channel 4 largely focused on the UK. Are you seeing differences within, even within the UK, obviously some of your seeing marketing with your audiences from Wales, England, Scotland, are you seeing there's difference on a local level? Uh, we're focusing our investment strategy on platforms which are predisposed to uh, spend marketing on Facebook and Google, that's the competition here. So, and where we can use brand marketing to accelerate them through minority, like our minority investment strategy. Uh, generally speaking, I'm finding that the digital consumer econ economy is based in London. Um, it's also f probably a function of our team. There are still, like, we are actively looking for companies outside of London. But moreover, we're, we've done, most of our investments have been international. So we, we go to the US, we're across Europe. I'm finding that the companies we can invest in can benefit from our investment model. Um, are generally international, but probably European. I'm not going further field than Poland or Turkey at this moment. Great, so final thoughts before we end. We're talking about transforming brands, keeping pace and growing. Paul, what's your final thoughts to the audience on how they can, brands can do that and any words of wisdom you'd like to share before we end? Yeah, I think, well, we're, we're, at, a, we're at a time kind of in our history where kind of the, the, the opportunity um, has never been greater, right? To start up a business, to create new features, functionality, service models, business models. Um, and that is scary to a lot of large businesses who, um, See, disruption is really kind of a threat, but the fact is that you know, every, for every large business that's a bit kind of slow or siloed, right, or has cultural issues around how they can start driving innovation, there are plenty of sparks within those organizations, right, that, that can be fanned. And within those organizations, they have things like brand equity and supply chain and manufacturing down the way that smaller companies can. So I think the, um, the balance between kind of the, 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 the fast, kind of fail fast, innovative, kind of startup model, but then something that's a bit more considered um, in, in terms of what assets and kind of equity already exists n needs to be considered before companies get too crazy about kind of abandoning what they have now um, for, for uncertain futures or, or uncertain ventures. Johnny? Yeah, I think uh, for us it's, it's making sure that your organization has uh, an appetite for experimentation and being okay with maybe some of the pilots uh, not going 100% the way you want them to. It's reframing what it is. So we talk a lot about validated learning. Yeah. So yes, maybe that pilot wasn't successful, but we know that it wasn't successful and we know why, and we can iterate on that and, and try something different uh, and, and continue to test and learn at low cost, fast pace, rather than maybe uh, a historical traditional way of doing it, which is much more kind of plan and perfect where you spend a lot more money up front trying to figure out what the consumer wants. Uh, this is more launch and learn and iterate. Um, all of that <laughs> and also uh, around leadership. I think it's critically important for the executive team to really be on board and um, be, be behind aligned execution on certain, on the agreed focus areas for innovation. Um, I think that's critically important. And finally, last but not least, um, I don't know. If, um, so, like, we can't, you can't be complacent. Innovation should be part of the agenda. It shouldn't be siloed. Uh, but be wary about throwing the, you know, 
I mean, that feels like trite, but I don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. Yeah. In, in, in also fostering that change. Mm. Well, look, I'd like to thank, firstly, all of our panellists. It's been an interesting discussion talking, seeing from how brands are engaging with the innovation ecosystem and trying to keep uh, on top of the game. So thank you very much to all our panellists. If we can have a round of applause. And uh, thank you. I think, Naomi, over to you. Thank all you. Right.